It's a lucky time explosion Today's guest is Rob Cantrell He's a well-known stand-up comic But he does other stuff real well Lucky time explosion Lucky time explosion Lucky time explosion Lucky time explosion of Lucky Time Explosion! Wow, wow, wow! Isn't it wild that one phrase, let's get ready to rumble, made Michael Buffer worth $400 million? Nice. It is a good phrase. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome back uh, to Lucky Time Explosion, everybody. It is Wednesday, Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Yay! Yay! Uh, we are here with a very special guest. Morgan, you want to introduce your friend? Rob Cantrell. That's right. The Rob Cantrell. How you been, man? I'm doing good. Nice. Good. Doing good. Yeah. Nice. So, so our, our show is like um, kind of an art-themed podcast. Okay. Uh, we have a little bit of art news to get through, which is, um, of course, Barbara Gladstone passed on, yes. uh, famous gallerist. Uh, she was responsible for launching the likes of Max, uh, Peter Max and Robert Rauschenberg and all these huge gallery artists. Uh, and so everyone's uh, respectfully mourning her passing. And in other art news, we have a really ugly dragon strapped to the top of the Empire State Building right now. Yeah. Oh, it's still there? <laughs> it's still there, I think. Ugh, Promoting get, Game of Thrones. We got to get rid of that thing. It looks like a big green turd wrapped around the top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> it's horrible. It's it didn't good. come out well. I don't think it was a hit. No, no, no. Maybe that's why the guy uh, in Midtown was throwing chairs and uh, cement oh, off uh, the top of a building. I'm going to have to edit that in the, in the green screen, of, of course. Of course. Yeah. That guy was either having fun or a bad day. Right. But we have Rob on today, so we're going to talk a little bit about the art of stand-up. Oh, we can talk about that, or the giant lizard, uh, or the guy freaking out. I relate to all of those. Uh, yeah, choose. I want to be on a roof throwing chairs now and then, and uh, I, the lizard. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know. Uh, it, it is impressive. Impressive that they put it up there, and that advertising has gone that far. I know. And colliding with the art world and the. Lizard World, uh, <laughs> which some or Dungeons and Dragons. Same. I was trying, you know, somewhere in there. That's just a uh, wild. And then stand up, yeah, that's uh, right up my alley too. It is. You've been doing it for a minute, and uh, you've gotten a lot of success with it, which is awesome. We're from the same uh, kind of area. We were both in the Bay Area for a while. Yeah, I yeah. started stand up uh, comedy in uh, San Francisco proper in 1999, right at the turn of the 2000s. Nice. Um, right where Y2K was about to happen. Everybody was getting <laughs> cans together. And uh, the switch didn't happen. I know. Yeah. I was disappointed. I, I was, was so for bummed. <laughs> I was, was so pissed. So I was like, waiting for like, you know, uh, the uh, last day of the year. And I was waiting for everyone to lose their minds. Everything resets to zero. Yeah. I had 103 degree fever. <laughs> oh wow! Like that night you remember mind. it? Oh yeah. my gosh! New Year's was never better than that. That was the best New Year's. <laughs> that was. <laughs> you, you were holding it down at the brainwash, right? I was holding it down, but I remember that one. Uh, I was in San Francisco, and I started July of '99. First time I moved into San Francisco, and I the brainwash was my second open mic. My first was on Market Street, the luggage store. As oh. an artist, did you ever go there? They had actually didn't. wild art installations. Yeah. And that was on Market Street. Ooh. And it was literally like prostitutes out front. And you had to go up these stairs. And it was like weird gay art everywhere. <laughs> and they had an open mic. And that was my first. Oh, <laughs> damn. And then I went down the street to the punk rock uh, Laundromat where they right. had uh, where they had an open mic. My man Tony Sparks oh, was yeah. the MC of the day. But yeah, I loved the Bay Area. I had such a blast in starting comedy there. My first three years was just like I don't know. Looking back on it, you know, I wanted like a Jack Kerouac like yeah type of adventure, and I did. I lived in a fucking hostel for like a year. I worked the night shift next to all the strip clubs, and I did the comedy all during like the days and nights all around the Bay Area. That's cool, man. For people who don't, uh, people who don't know, listening, the Brainwash is a laundromat and venue. Yeah. And if you and if you go there and you perform there, I remember. I don't know if this is the same for you, but they gave us a fifty dollar voucher that you had uh, the choice of either using it for the bar 
or for your laundry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, awesome. brainwash bucks. Yeah, brainwash no, bucks. Yeah, yeah. And they had they had fresh juices. It was still kind of punk rock. Like it was still like they had like vegan hamburgers. But next door, it was a legit like laundra laundromat. But right. they had the good machines, like you know the ones that you could really get your socks. You know, they, <laughs> thank God. A good like a, a good laundromat is like L.A.'s got some good ones. San Francisco had some good ones. The one I used to go to in the village when I lived in the village was a. Uh, it, it would increase its prices every week. I yeah, New do York my laundry gets a little bit week. intense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd go in there every week. I'd be like, now it's four dollars. Now it's five dollars. Yeah, now, now it's six dollars. It's, it's not as fun or, it, on the East Coast. But we have wash and fold here. You know, yeah, I use I use the hell out of that. Yeah, that's really awesome. Uh, I and I know you're probably sick of talking about. Uh, the last comic standing, but I have to bring it up because our, one of our first guests, uh, on this podcast was the suck Lord, the super suck Lord. He is an artist who makes toys like ba bootleg action figures is his medium. And he rose to prominence also on a contest reality television show called work of art on Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, it got me thinking last night when I was thinking about this episode and, uh, and meeting you and, and chatting with you, I was like, wow, you know, we really are living through this time where reality television had a fucking chokehold on us and really defined a lot of culture. You know, my peers, the suck Lord is out there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I've heard about the suck Lord. I know about the, I know he's a lower East side artist and yep. I had a filmmaker friend that worked with that dude. Oh, nice. Uh, but yeah, that last comic standing 2003, uh, that was me uh, yep. living in a mansion in the Hollywood Hills on NBC television. Ooh. Uh, it was wild. It was a really, uh, w really weird time. Yeah. It was a weird time all around. All around. 2003 was wild. It was. I think uh, one of my favorite jokes you heard when you were on the show is something about like uh, rubbing wax fruit. Under uh, homeless people's noses, be like, you like that? Yeah. You like yeah that I said, uh, <laughs> strip clubs. I said, uh, that was my first take on strip. I said, I don't like going to strip clubs because, uh, you know, it's something like, oh, it's something about like, I don't like going to strip clubs uh, because you just get really horny and then they hit you up for money. Like, uh, that'd be like going up to a really hungry man and going yeah. to your face with a pl plastic right. pear. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, you're really hungry. You, you want to like eat this. this. Yeah, you can't eat it. Give me $5. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like in some ways that show was kind of, re like, responsible for um, a broadening audience in comedy, though. Because, like, after that show happened, like, there was a lot more... Uh, stand up was taken more like in a weird way more seriously after the reality TV show. I know. <laughs> you know, it's like there's a huge boom in the 2000s after it. And before that, I remember it not being as in like as, you know, not there wasn't so many specials. 100% right. Yeah, it's hard to explain to people, but in 99 when I started stand up, it was not cool. Like yeah. clubs were closing down. If you went to a party, I remember talking to Harmon Leon, great artist, great writer, does like the Edinburgh Festival. But we were talking like we remember when stand up was like as cool as telling somebody you were a cop. Yeah, like, it yeah, hundred percent. It was like nobody did it anymore. It was whack from the eighties. It, it got overplayed. So everybody totally. kind of like you know they kind of they liked Bobcat Goldquist. but in an ironic phase, you know, it was definitely the peak of hipster like uh, Gen X type shit. But yeah. I knew it was coming back around and I knew how good it was and I yeah. loved Pryor and uh, I loved uh, the first Eddie Murphy special was huge to me and then the first uh, HBO, you know, I was born in 72 so I saw the very first Robin Williams special was right. huge on HBO. That was at the Great American Music Hall. Uh, Eddie Murphy just blew up. I just saw the heyday of it all and I remember seeing a young Jim Carrey on... Um, on the Young Comedian special, oh, yeah. which was just like 10 minutes on, but it was on HBO, so it was captured like really good, and they would just get the best of the best comics. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like art, uh, you know, I think that, I say a lot that I think video games are the highest form of art, but stand-up might be one of the purest. Uh, you know, it is such a, an interesting thing, and I especially think about how artists have this allure and mystery, and it's sort of the opposite of the stand-up comedian. The stand -up, There's so many stand-up comedians that start, like, self-deprecating, saying that, like, they're a stand-up because they, like, don't have anything else to do. <laughs> like, they're, in the, they're at the end of their <laughs> rope, and it's, like, not a glamorous thing, and people think that being an artist is a glamorous thing, but there's kind of the opposite as the stand-up. Yeah, and I think artists are the ones that can truly appreciate it, like, how hard being a stand up is. Yeah. And uh, regular people don't really see it, but artists and musicians understand. 
you know, that's what I always say about stand up. Like, I didn't start doing stand up till I was 27. Mm. And I always wanted to do it. I cut out uh, pictures of open mics when I was in the, like the eighth grade. Wow. It was right before, you know, you start drinking. I was about to do stand up, but I didn't. And you know why I didn't do it? Why? Because I thought it was going to be hard. Yeah. I just knew it was going to be hard. And guess what? When I started doing it, guess what? It was hard. It was 10 times harder <laughs> yeah. than I thought it was going to be. It was 10 times harder. So, I mean, just as an art, I think as an artist, you know, it's like, I, it, that was, I was talking to this heavy metal uh, guitarist. Like, it is the lowest common art form. Yeah. But it really is hard as fuck to do on a high level. Like, doing mm. stand up at a high level, no matter if you hate the guy or love the girl or think they're whack or whatever, it's just really fucking hard to do 45 minutes up there really good. Yeah. Um, and to take it serious. It's the same as I was talking, like, heavy metal guitarists. Like, you think of, like, a Metallica guitarist as, like, kind of a goon, right? right. <laughs> yeah. But they're really, it's, like, the most complicated, hard-ass music to play. Yeah, they're, like, like... Like, riding the lightning. Like, you're literally doing, right. like, I mean, viol I, violin I listen shit. to Dream Theater, so, you know. <laughs> it's, like, classical Berkeley music. Berkeley guys, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, no, I mean, you know, also people don't realize, you know, being funny and doing stand-up are two completely different things. Oh, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People always, like, telling me, you should do stand-up, you should do stand-up, you're funny. And I thought about it, and I, like, tried to write a joke. And I wake up the next day and look at my notebook. I'm like, this, fuck, no, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, no, I tried. I tried. I think it was a place called Dra Jack Rabbit Slims. Yes. I don't even think it's there anymore. Who knows? I, I remember Jack Rabbit. Yeah. I've done every fucking open mic and bar room in this I mean, city. Since five minutes seemed like an hour. Oh, like yeah. I went, it was the first and only time I did it. And um, I wasn't horrible, but I literally just did five minutes and it felt like forever. Forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember the first time doing it, and I killed. And then the second time, I went in with all this bravo, and I yeah. just died and like <laughs> left the stage yelling at the audience, like, couldn't take it. Like because oh, no. you're right. That's what I'm saying. It's like, and when you write the jokes down, that's what's so hard about saying up and getting older. But I, mm. I love it. But it, you, it really is a dance in the moment. You know what I'm saying? It's like. You can't tell what it is until it's it there. Yeah. Until that moment happens, you don't know if it's funny or not. None of these guys really, you, you pitch it and you start to get your percentile up, but you really, it's just that magic moment. You has to have the audience. Like, it's just this weird thing. There was this cool venue called um, Goodbye Blue Monday that was on Broadway in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. I don't know if you've ever heard about that place. No. Uh, and they would do, you know, open mic. And I saw this one guy go up and he was just bombing so hard. He was just like, you know, ready to have a panic attack. And then all of a sudden he just started acting real and like acting like himself and talking about his day. And he like turned it around and fuck wow. it. And it was like hilarious. And he crushed it. And I never saw anybody like be able to turn around a bomb like so epically and I was like that's fucking badass and, and that was pretty cool so do you remember like a, a particular bit uh, that was like one of the first things that made you like love comedy and want to do it like any particular favorite bits yeah uh, that I I have to say Eddie Murphy ice cream like mm. that whole thing and then you Richard, dropped your ice cream, cream. You, you dropped, dropped your ice cream, cream. <laughs> you know and 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 i did open for tracy morgan for a while and tracy's oh, nice. the same way that it's uh it's just pure funny it's not technical you know and I, I mean eddie murphy is technical but he was like a young three years in cocky confident but funny, naturally funny, and just learned the craft and knew how to do it, and then, you know, figured out how to do SNL. And I think after doing stand-up in sketch at that high level, there's really not much you can't do in terms of the performing arts. Yeah. It's true. You know, if it's movies or television, after dealing with doing stand-up and then live television where you're acting in sketches and doing right. characters, like, not much... After that, there's not... I mean... Acting's challenging, and I think every performance is different, but it's not going to intimidate you. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Um, my favorite bit uh, growing up was Emo Phillips bridge joke. <laughs> do you know that one? <laughs> I don't know that one. I probably do Ooh. if I heard it. it it's a really but smart joke. But he's an amazing joke, joke writer. No, yeah. he's like the one of the best. It's it probably, still is. It's probably one of the longest jokes ever. Uh, it, it goes on forever, but he basically is trying to talk a guy down from committing suicide on a bridge. And it just keeps going on and on and on. It makes you build a lot of empathy with him. And then at the end, he's arguing about religion. And they go down the different um, sects of Christianity and he's like gets to the last one and it's just like 15 words long and then he says no I'm this one which is like slightly different and he goes die heretic and he pushes <laughs> him off and it was just so good like it was just really it was, I thought it was one of the f- smartest oh, and funniest bits he was ever. great in that UHF remember he was in UHF yeah. he cuts his finger off yeah. he's like oh Mr. Butterfingers <laughs> and there's like yeah. blood squirting all over the place uh, great movie what are you yeah. up to now what's next for you uh, now I, I have been doing a little bit more acting like during the pandemic is, uh, you know, I stopped touring as much and right now I'm working on a one man show called 1972, which is the Ooh. year I was born. I've been doing that at Young Ethel's in the South Slope. I did three shows just recently and they were packed out and fun. And so nice. that's kind of like in the stand up world, like my one man show type of uh, angle that I'm taking. So I'm kind of putting that in my back pocket, but building that out and kind of organically see, just starting with the day I was born and then going through stories, but also keeping it, it's in a dive bar, cool dive bar, um, that also does improv and music, and is that it's any just relation to the Ethel's that like uh, Ethel's uh, club uptown? Ethel, like a, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, okay, there's like a, there's an it's, Ethel's near me uh, uptown, and it's like a, it's just some sort of like speakeasy kind of rockabilly place. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so I've been doing that, working on my one man show, and then auditioning and writing scripts, and you know, and then just doing the overall hustle, and you know, do, still doing shows. Still doing stand up. I have a blast doing it. I did it last night. Um, Where were you last night? At Chelsea Music Hall for oh, cool. this uh, dog benefit. But Janine Garofalo was on the bill, and so was Seth Herzog and uh, Christian Finnegan. Janine Garofalo is like the one celebrity that I keep fucking seeing all the time. Like anytime I'm in the West Village, she's out walking her dogs. Like, yeah, I, she's I out there the in time. these streets. Yeah, she really is. I see she's, her that's why all the stand ups <laughs> love her. And because uh, she's always out doing spots. So yeah. it'll be like a weird B room somewhere that you wouldn't think. Uh, a movie star or a hipster icon would be and <laughs> she goes up and does 10 minutes and it's always brilliant and always kind of new and kind of original and she's always kind of pushing it so yeah okay. i'm always starstruck by her like that's, even i awesome. see her around for like 10 years and i'm still like ah oh, shit that's janine garofalo yeah and that's I just because i met age. her once because i used to do uh i was a background actor for strangers with candy yeah with matt and she was on an episode brilliant show uh, she looked like really upset that day, so I tried to like keep my distance. I was like, "Oh my God, Jenny Garofalo, <laughs> wee hoo, wee hoo!" Uh, but yeah, no, it was cool standing I, next to her. You know? I, I met yeah. a ton of celebrities <laughs> working at like this movie theater for the California Film Institute. So I got kind of jaded because I got to meet a lot of my heroes early on, like David Lynch and all oh, these wow. huge actors. Uh, but the was w- that in the Bay Area or in that LA? Was. Yeah, it was in Bay Area. It was in San Rafael, California. Cool. Uh, the Rafael Film Center. The and it was an Beach indie Beach film. Center. Center down there, and then all these great directors that lived in California would come through and yep. like do movies and stuff. Wow. It was it was and the talks. it was the organization that put on the Mill Valley Film Festival, which was a big film festival, and uh, they so everyone would come in once a year, and it would be this whole hoopla. But the one time I actually felt starstruck was in New York, and I was a barista, and Nathan Fielder came in, and and Nathan <laughs> for you had just like you know aired, and I was like obsessed with it, and he came in, and I was just like Nathan Fielder's the one who gave me the oh my god. No, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> And I'm a big fan. He it's was hilarious. funny as hell. Yeah, the show's really good. It is. Uh, but the Mill Valley's really nice too, though, man. Milf I, Valley, they call it. The, oh my god! Because everyone there has a lot of work done, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Milf Valley. But isn't that where Bob Weir lives now? So many people live there. Dana Carvey lives there. Um, uh, all of Metallica lives there. Uh, Sean Penn, who would come to the theater all the time. I know the I Throckmorton to Theater. You ever been there? That that's oh. a little. Uh, yeah, performance theater in the Mill Valley that's like a dope Tuesday night for stand-ups. Like they have this show that's in the Mill Valley, which is like 
just the sweetest part of uh, Northern California. Like, if you are, like, the head of the Grateful Dead, you would live there. <laughs> yeah. If you are the head of Metallica, you it's would live true, there. It's true, I knew it's Jerry's so daughter. It's so beautiful. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah, we'd hang out a bunch. She was cool. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, really the funny. Dead is, like, you know, the president up there. Like really? every Yeah, they really are have the best real estate. Those are the guys that first got a hold of all this, like, dope-ass real estate, and they were young enough and had money enough to, like pick up these farms and like I don't yeah. know California is just amazing I just went out there for two days and I hadn't been out there since the pandemic and I was like holy fuck man this is nice <laughs> <laughs> that's funny but I like New York a lot I mean uh, I walk it keeps me young so yeah I, 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 I did 30,000 steps the other day totally holy shit that's yeah. the thing about that's New like York one full year for me yeah dude I go hard in the paint out there you ever notice how like any old people you see walking around in New York are like way older and more in shape than any other old people you, you see anywhere else yeah. in the country you, you have to you I see like 90 year old like 95 year old people like the walkers like Look by themselves more, he looks 32 and he's 58 <laughs> <laughs> you just have to we go up these stairs and r run around on these sidewalks and those walkers and it's like, it's just, uh, just get it. You know, it, it, I love getting here, it's but it's beautiful just out getting today. here. It's, it's beautiful out. Yeah. yeah. The parks are aw awesome. Uh, it, just life is hard. That's what I've been talking about is like just waking up, taking dumps and uh, wiping and washing your face. Well, and, that, that leads me to, you know, today is a special day for me. I know I am, we uh, talked about this. Preparing <laughs> myself tomorrow for something called a colonoscopy. <laughs> and it's when they put a camera up your butt, right? Uh, or they well, clear you listen, out. That's to be honest with you, no, you're, there are both of those are both true. I'm going to be knocked out, so I'm not sure what they're going to do to That's me. That's how I'm going to believe too. everything that they say after the fact. <laughs> Can we somehow get like a live stream going of your butthole? Or that they, would be uh, amazing. Do they just stream it from there, the because there's office? a few communities inside there, so you, you know there's. A, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I you know had to go. This is originally the reason I'm getting this is because I have hemorrhoids, and they're like, listen, before we even chop that shit off we got to give you a colonoscopy. And after seeing that dentist, I had a whole new special relationship with that. With, it was hard. The, 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 dentist. the, the dentist. Yeah, he the was the dentist the is doing your ass. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Not the dentist. Jesus Christ. Make sure Christ. they got the gloves on. That's some sort of vagina dentata stuff. Yeah. Great Butthole movie, has teeth by the now. way. <laughs> teeth is a great movie. But anyway. Is the, it really? <laughs> the, I, well, the ending is quite interesting. If you've seen Teeth, it's right? real. That's, what, seen, that's yo, all I remember. Yeah, yeah. The dog eats the brother's peppy. I just remember them screaming. The vagina dentata is real. But yeah, he he did something to me, and now he's we're we're going to dinner next week. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> me and I'm doctor. very happy for you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I have to stop. I'm not eating anything solid today. I have to drink this jug of this crazy powder stuff. Yeah, and like just crap my brains out. Oh, it's gonna feel great. Time. Yeah, I, I mean I'm hearing good things. I'm. You know, I'm a little bit nervous because I never had it done before. I just I was nervous really. too. Yeah, you are going to get violated. You got to be nice to yourself. <laughs> yeah, you have yeah, to be yeah. very tender with yourself and slow with yourself, and just go in there with just good, pr uh, just just <laughs> just <laughs> pray. Up. I don't know. <laughs> I was uh, about to say to pray. I was going to say yeah, you, but it really is kind of one of those moments. Anytime you go into surgery, anytime you go into the doctor, there is like this solace. Like there is this like vibe. Hey, that reminds me, we're at Solus Studios, spelled oh, differently. Yeah. yeah, come check us out. We do fine art printing and uh, lots of gallery shows. And Maybe stand-up soon. Maybe we should do a stand-up night. <laughs> we could. For a tiny, tiny we have audience. Music. Who we did have the logo music for this podcast? Oh, uh, I think I did. You did it. Yeah, the, which one, though? I don't know. I was just wondering, because you're both artists. Oh, actually, who gets that job? I did the yeah. first one, which was just a bunch of bullshit. But then uh, <laughs> Brandon did something cool that was not bullshit. You did this thing, though, behind us. And that, that's really good as well. Yeah. Oh, that was funny, though, because we, we posted on Facebook. I said, what do you think of our new logo? And then somebody said, oh, it looks just like the Death Squad podcast logo, which is the one that produces Kill Tony. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, what? And then I look at it, and sure enough, they, they've got like a lucky cat on theirs, too. It is way different, but I was like, oh, okay, I guess we're good company. Way better, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, man, totally. Our lucky cat is luckier. Did you That's use true. AI making this no. logo? Oh, no, no. Oh, just the hammer or the lucky cat? I know that's the move is like... You're like, yo, I'm an artist. I'm, I just want some right. eyeballs done. Right? It's, it's so you tough. Do, you do AI eyeball. We do AI music for the intro, so it's different every time. Oh, that's I cool. Said, actually, you, you know what? Why don't you decide what our intro music's going to be? What prompt would you give our AI robot to do the uh, intro music for your episode? Oh, dub. 
Dude. Reggae metal. Dub nice. reggae metal. I like that. And it will do that. <laughs> yeah. It will do that. I'll I don't know. The link. It's called Suno. Um, yeah. They should give us money. A AI is really weird. And it, the thing that I have an issue with right now is just the bad rep. You know, and it's like the people want to stay far away from it. And I like I'm afraid of offending musicians and artists by, you know, mentioning even bringing using it, it up yeah. almost. Yeah, almost. It's like they just they're scowl and they're so they're so aggressive about it. But I look at all these new like, I love poster art. So I, I look at a lot of poster art and oh, yeah. yeah Dinosaur Jr. has some sick poster art. Yeah, that yeah. one home where it's like the trees are walking the people back. Yes. That's the sickest piece of art I've seen in a minute. But uh a lot of these new tour posters seem like it's very highly detailed. Like, can the they crack? A, are, are, are they using AI? Are like these mainstream bands using AI for tour? Day, you know, tour probably, posters? probably. Well, listen, probably. they can cut out having to pay the artists, which is sad. They already do that, though. They don't need to use AI to screw over artists. They've already been at that. Well, that's true. <laughs> but then, then again, comes back to original thought. Yeah, which is the the saving grace I think for to being an artist is the only person that will survive in yeah. the art world. Like how being an original thinker because everybody can do this other shit. Right. So you have to really core out. Like you got to go core than you've ever co done core. But in doing that, you'll be a billionaire. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I yeah. agree. Yeah. That's why we're doing what we're doing today. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I, I feel like I wish people would get more upset about, uh, you know, like self-checkout and self-driving trucks. That's going to have a much bigger impact on our quality of life, you know, as a society than replacing artists, honestly, I think. Because but people, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, it's fine. I mean, I, I don't think that, um, I, have, I have very mixed feelings about it. I like playing with it, but I also think like obviously art, music, stand-up comedy, it's kind of all about the originality of the human. So how do you even officially offload that? Like, what are we really making when we make AI art? Is yeah. it actually art? You know, I've been playing with it with, with my logo. Mm. Um, I did my first logo with just some images on Canva, yep. and then uh, I, I liked it. And then I got a dude to do another one that did it great, a great artist that was a comedian. And then, uh, and then I hired another person to do it, and now I don't like it at all. <laughs> and now I'm like, I need to hand draw this, because it's do me. That. Yeah. It's me, and it's my thing, and no. A and then I tried to play with AI, and I'm like, give me a coffee cup, give me this. And then I was like, none of these are dope. Like, none of these, I want a, a good line. Give me some good lines. Yeah, and then I was like, lines. I can make good lines. And so I thought I'd go back to doing it myself. Do you do a lot of drawing? I love drawing. Ooh. I love art. I love doing art. I never was an art school kid, but um, I did take drawing lessons and I still draw today. I have like 10,000 Sharpies, colored Ooh. Sharpies that I just like have a notepad and I just do bubble letters and a lot of bubble letters. Uh, a lot of cats. You getting out on the street then with the bubble letters? You tag her? Oh, and just yeah, I know. I love graffiti art, but graffiti's gotten too much. Graffiti has changed a lot. It's it's also branched out with street art and graffiti have like uh, diverged. Diverged. They're not the same anymore. Yeah, and there's a the, the thing about graffiti. It is the highest. It's like it's high end. Right now, because it it's so, but it's so low end at yeah. the same time. Because low end becomes high end, but at the same time, the part of graffiti, I I don't like the anarchist part of graffiti the <laughs> vigilante and just doing it to fuck over the government and then the environment i'm not down with right i am down with the poor kid that wants to express himself and do a 3d bubble letter right and then have like fucking you know uh casper the goat a ghost smoking a joint like yeah. i do that all day i'm for that um, that's I, where I'm at with it. I definitely see that in street art because a lot of times, you know, the messaging will be really like pretty dumb or or simplistic or just like not thoughtful or provoking. And I'm just yeah. like, uh, maybe yeah. artists aren't the ones to be talking about this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, that's randomly, true. randomly, I could tell you that today is International Garfield Day. Oh, oh I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and of course, for those who don't know, the voice of Garfield. His name is Lorenzo Music, one of the greatest names like ever. Lorenzo Music. Lorenzo Music. That is very random. Probably because the counter is going down so low and we have to leave soon. 
<laughs> if but, you didn't know, Garfield is a uh, Gmail was originally Garfield mail. Did you know that? Oh, wow. Yeah. It used to be Garfield themed web mail. <laughs> I love it. He had some great lines, like the Garfield, the drawn, like I like how his ears are drawn. Yeah. I like how those stripes are drawn and I like how those eyeballs are drawn. Iconic. And there's a new one coming out again and everyone's upset about it because it like looks a little different, which is, you know, tail as old as time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's got to evolve though, right? Honest art does evolve. It's true. It's true. Um, you can't keep it the same or it feels whack. Yeah. It's weird. I get, we got to let stuff. Rob get out of here. So let's wrap this up blast. pretty quick. Thank you so much. Yeah, I yeah, do too. I would love to have you there. back. Really interesting yeah. conversation. I'd and love I feel to like come we back. Could talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, tell people about your podcast and where they can follow you online. It's called the uh, Cannabis Coffee Hour CCH. Uh, just Google it up into uh, Spotify and iTunes. It's there. And I'm at robcantrell.com. Amazing. Thank Woo! you so much for joining us. And have a great day, everybody. Thanks for having Hasta me. Hasta la pasta. It's a lucky time explosion. Today's guest is Rob Cantrell. He's a well-known stand-up comic, but he does other stuff real well. Lucky time, explosion, lucky time.